Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to Brain and Behavior. I am Dr. Ark Varma from IIT Kanpur. As you know, I work at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and also the Interdisciplinary Program for Cognitive Sciences at the Institute. This is the second week of the course and we are talking about methods to study brain function, normal brain function and so on. Today we will talk about uh, some of the methods which focus on the structural analysis of the brain. Let us begin it. Now, uh, there is a range of methods in cognitive science, there have been a range of methods in cognitive science which have been concerned with basically studying the structural properties of the brain, the anatomical uh, details of the brain. These methods have mainly focused upon the anatomical differences and the nature of the biological tissue, biological material to reveal the structural details of the brain. Let us look at some of those examples today. The, one of the main uh, methods that has uh, been um, uh, instrumental uh, in getting uh, some kind of a structural overview, some kind of structural uh, footage of the brain is the computerized tomography. Now, computerized tomography or CT as it is popularly known has been a pioneering tool for structural imaging of the neurological damages in uh, patients. CT scanning basically enables the reconstruction of 3D space of the 3D image of the brain by combining several 2D images which have actually been obtained using the X-ray method. In this method, multiple X-ray beams as you can see in the picture on the right, multiple X-ray beams are passed through the head generating each generating a separate 2D image. The sides of the scanner rotate and X-ray beams are then sequentially projected and 2D images are formed through this 180 degree arc. Now finally what happens is sophisticated software and computer technology is used to reconstruct the 3D images from the 2D images that are obtained from the CD scanner. Although with the CT scan method, uh, we are not able to discriminate uh, areas which are closer than 5 mm, so it does not really have a very high spatial resolution, but it can help us uh, get clear pictures of uh, the larger uh, structures of the brain. So in that sense, it is a fairly useful technique. We can then now talk about magnetic resonance imaging. Now magnetic resonance imaging is a method that can produce high resolution images of soft tissue of the brain. This method basically utilizes the magnetic properties of the atoms that uh, constitute the organic tissue that makes up the brain. As the organic tissue uh, contains these hydrogen atoms which contain protons uh, and these protons are continuously spinning around their principal axis which creates a little bit of a weak magnetic field. Now when a person is, uh, is sent inside the MRI scanner, a large number of these protons become oriented in the direction parallel to the magnetic field created by this MRI machine. Whenever you come across an MRI machine, you will see that it has a magnetic, it has a magnetic power of uh, a few Teslas, 1 Tesla, 0.5 Tesla, 1.5 Tesla. Uh, more advanced uh, machines have a magnetic, uh, have very high magnetic power of 2, 3 Tesla. Now this magnetic field basically instrumental in uh, getting these images out. So let's come back. When a person is sent inside the MRI machine, the, a large number of these protons which are uh, making up this organic uh, tissue uh, become oriented in a direction parallel to the magnetic field that is created by the MRI. Then what happens is the radio waves are passed through this, uh, through the magnetized regions and the protons absorb the energy in these waves which causes a disturbance in their orientation towards a particular predictable direction. So you would know that okay, in which direction these are going to get oriented. Now, when these radio waves are turned off, the absorbed energy by the protons is released producing energy signals that can be picked up by the detectors in the MRI scanner. Systematically measuring these signals around the head allows the MRI scanner to construct an image based on the distribution of protons and other magnetic atoms in the tissue. As the distribution of hydrogen atoms varies throughout the brain, it allows the MRI to distinguish clearly the brain's grey matter, white matter, ventricles and fibre tracts. So you can see that it is giving a very clear, a very detailed description of the anatomical parts of the brain. MRI scans are therefore capable of providing much clearer images than the CT scan with a much higher resolution of as small as up to 1 mm, allowing images to even capture uh, very, very small subcortical structures such as the mammillary bodies or the superior colliculi and those nuclei uh, that are in the midbrain. Now let's talk about another uh, very important method which is the method of diffusion tensor imaging. 
Now diffusion tensor imaging is a very important method which is basically used to study the anatomical structure of the axonal tracts that compose the brain's white matter. If you remember we've talked about this in the past, the white matter is basically the axons of the millions of neurons, billions of neurons actually that are forming the brain whereas the top of the surface which is grayish in color is basically the cell bodies. Now the diffusion tensor imaging uh, method is basically more focused at studying the anatomical uh, structure of the brain using these axonal tracts of the neurons that compose the brain's white matter. And therefore they can offer us a very uh, detailed insight into the structural connectivity of the brain. The connections between neurons in the brain are basically via these axons and in case there is a method to actually look at how these axons are connected to each other, how they extend into different areas of the brain that will and that is bound to provide us with a lot of details about the structural connectivity of the brain, which areas are connected to which areas, which areas project to the other areas and receive reaction from some other areas. This information can be very, very useful in basically figuring out, uh, you know, what kind of networks of uh, brain areas are involved in doing particular cognitive tasks. So, uh, this is performed uh, typically with an MRI scanner that is capable of measuring the density and the motion of water contained in the axons. These uh, axons contain some uh, amount of water and what this method does is it utilizes the properties of this water that is contained in the axonal tracts to determine the boundaries that restrict water movement. So if water is there it will uh, flow to different directions but there are these boundaries within these axonal tracts that will restrict the movement of the water throughout the brain. Now for instance what could happen is uh, for instance a very important property of this uh, water that is contained here is that it is anisotropic and it basically meaning that it distributes unequally in all directions. It does not spread out in all directions but just spreads out to some directions which are predictable in the brain. Now diffusion tensor imaging basically involves releasing two large pulses uh, to the magnetic field created by the MRI scanner. So two large pulses are created. Now what happens is that the first pulse basically determines the initial position of the protons carried by the water whereas the second pulse introduced after a short delay detects the movements of uh, protons in a specific direction. So one is in some sense tagging the protons, the other is actually determining where the protons are moving from there. As the flow of water is constrained by the axons, the resulting image that is obtained is capable of revealing major white matter tracts of the brain. DDI therefore is a very interesting method that has uh, basically been used extensively to identify the connectivity patterns in the brain. So it is also something that maybe we'll come across when you're basically looking at the other chapters, we'll come across some of the methods, uh, some of the uh, experiments that are using the diffusion tensor imaging method. Now let us move our focus uh, to some of the methods that are actually more involved in studying the functioning brain. Okay? So we have seen some of the methods that do the structural analysis that are more about uh, you know what are the uh, structural details of the brain but we can now move towards some of the methods that uh, are capable of measuring the in vivo uh, functioning of the human brain. Now the advent of uh, electrodes and uh, systems capable of recording electrical activity from this you know bunch of electrodes uh, fitted a cap and uh, even say for example fitted from a single neuron has been a revolutionizing development for cognitive neuroscience and uh, its allied fields. This has most certainly enabled researchers to examine the functioning human brain. You, we know that the human brain functions through electrical and chemical communications, electrical and chemical signaling and that can be actually measured using some of the methods that I am going to talk about now. First and the foremost method that uh, has been very, very instrumental, more so for animal models but has been very instrumental to understand the generic functioning of a mammalian brain is that of single cell recordings. Now single cell recordings basically have uh, allowed researchers to understand the response patterns of individual neurons in the brain. So they are basically methods that basically allow you to uh, look at how a single neuron behaves. Okay. Now what happens in this method is that a thin electrode is inserted inside the animal's brain and as the electrode reaches in the vicinity of these neuronal membranes, it can measure the changes in the electrical activity surrounding this electrode, basically whatever is happening in the surrounding neurons. Mostly this is done extracellularly because if you uh, sort of impinge or insert uh, uh, the electrode inside uh, the neuronal membrane of a particular neuron, there are more chances that you will damage it. 
So typically it is done extracellularly, so the electrode is there and some neurons are just uh, around itself and basically what it does is therefore it is picking up the electrical activity that is happening around itself. Interestingly, there is almost no guarantee that uh, whether the electrical activity recorded by the single electrode is uh, from one neuron or from a bunch of neurons. So uh, this is most probably through coming from a bunch of neurons that are surrounding this electrode. So to sort of solve this uh, puzzle, uh, help is taken from uh, sophisticated software uh, which are utilized to basically separate the pooled activity that is recorded on the single electrode uh, to isolate uh, activity of single neurons. Now the main goal of these uh, experiments is basically to determine what experimental manipulations produce a consistent change in the response rate of a single cell. You might have seen figures and we will see uh, some of them uh, moving further is that uh, in single cell recordings with macaques, uh, very, very simple, very, very unidimensional stimuli are used. So, if for example, you can show uh, the monkey one uh, straight line uh, and then you can uh, show them straight vertical line, uh, horizontal line and then uh, the line oriented by 10 degrees uh, to each side and so on. Or you can show them some very specific picture and see what is uh, actually happening. So this kind of uh, studies are typically done with single cell recordings and basically the dependent variables are whether the neuron is firing or not, if they are firing, what is the firing rate and how does this firing rate uh, basically change with respect to the stimulus or with respect to different properties of uh, the stimulus like motion, color and so on, orientation for example. Now these measurements are then contrasted with the baseline firing rate measurements where there is no stimulus and the baseline firing rate of that neuron is measured. Single cell recordings therefore have proved to be useful and have been used uh, to determine uh, the behavior of neurons in almost all regions of the brain and across all a wide range of species, non-human species mostly. Now for example, uh, sensory neuron, uh, the type of stimulus if you want to kind of uh, you know look at the behavior of the sensory neuron. Uh, the type of stimulus that uh, could be presented might be varied whereas for a motor neuron recordings can be made when the animal is uh, viewing motion or making some kind of motion uh, itself. We can talk a little bit about uh, single cell recording in humans. Now in humans uh, for obvious reasons because you cannot really penetrate the skull and insert an electrode and uh, because there are these ethical issues and obviously uh, you do not want to harm the person. So for obvious reasons uh, single cell recordings are extremely rare in humans. However, sometimes or once in a long time it might happen that if a certain patient is going for some kind of a neurosurgical procedure sometimes to treat epilepsy or for some other reason a stroke or something, uh, sometimes uh, basically uh, doctors uh, would uh, with the permission of the patient insert uh, some of these intracranial electrodes as a preparation some, uh, to just localize where these abnormal uh, activity is happening that is leading to the epileptic seizures and so on. For epileptic patients uh, mostly what happens is that these electrodes are most commonly placed in the medial temporal lobe where the focus of the seizures is most frequent. Now, uh, Fried and Kalik, Isaac Fried and Kalik uh, basically have shown that the medial temporal lobe neurons uh, in human beings can respond selectively to familiar images. Very interestingly, in an experiment, it was found that a particular patient's a neuron in the left posterior hippocampus of a patient, this neuron was specifically activated only by the pictures of the actress uh, Jennifer Aniston, different views of that uh, of the face, but not when the images of uh, other popular uh, or other well-known uh, people or places were shown. So in that sense that uh, selective response is uh, also found within humans as far as single cell recordings are concerned. Now uh, let us move on to another uh, method, electroencephalography. We have talked a little bit about that in the past. Now electroencephalography is a method where say for example a bunch of electrodes uh, embedded in a sort of a plastic cap are placed across the scalp and electrical activity is recorded from the scalp. Okay, so it is a bit of an indirect method because obviously uh, between the neurons in the brain there is uh, so much of this cerebrospinal fluid, there is uh, the skull and there is the scalp and everything. So it is sort of an indirect measure but it kind of gets the hang of this electrical conductivity and basically uh, uh, gets a decent estimate of what is going on inside the brain. The assumption is that uh, wherever this electrode is placed, it is basically capturing the electrical activity of uh, the neurons uh, uh, 
underlying this particular electrode. So that is uh, one of the reasons why you see that a large number of electrodes are, uh, are used say for example uh, anywhere between 8 electrodes, 16 electrodes to up to 256 electrodes which span the entire skull and which kind of allow you a very good resolution of as to where in the skull uh, a particular uh, neuronal activity is recorded with respect to any stimulus that you have presented. So this is basically how the electroencephalographic method is actually uh, conducted. More technically, I mean, just a little bit, I'll tell you. So what happens is that when you place these electrodes, there is this recording of changing voltage of the electrodes, which is typically then compared to a reference electrode, which is placed along the mastoid bone of the skull, wherein no neural activity is happening. And then you kind of compare these things, and there is where you get the uh, actual neural activity that might be happening inside the brain. Therefore, what it does is it uh, receives a continuous recording of the overall brain's electrical activity which can then be interpreted with reference to uh, different kinds of experimental conditions or manipulations. Over the years, researchers have identified several signature components that are associated with behavioral states and uh, are sort of used to predictably, to decently predict what kind of behavioral state a person is in. The identification of these states have had many clinical applications. For example, in a state of deep sleep, uh, the EEG waves are characterized by slow high amplitude oscillations, presumably resulting from rhythmic changes in the activity of large groups of neurons in the brain. Other phases of similarly, say for example, the non-REM sleep, uh, etc. have also been characterized similarly by different patterns of EEG waves. So this is one of the ways their uh, EEG recording can actually categorize the type of activity that is going on in the brain. A very interesting derivative of the EEG method is the method of extracting what are called event related potentials. Now as the EEG waveforms reveal patterns of global electrical activity of the brain, they actually tell us less about very specific cognitive processes to which maybe very specific areas of the brain might be responding. Now researchers have uh, obviously been interested in this electrical activity tied to specific events or specific kinds of, stimul uh, of stimulation. The method basically involves the extraction of an evoked response from the overall EEG signal. So what basically happens here is that EEG uh, traces are recorded from a series of trials and then they are averaged together by aligning them relative to an external event. So for example, I'm recording EEG waves uh, and I'm recording these waves uh, uh, for let us say two minutes or three minutes and within those two to three minutes, there are let us say five times or 10 times a particular uh, event has happened, a particular stimulus has happened. So what I will do is I'll uh, average out waves uh, relative to this particular uh, event or stimulation that I have presented and basically uh, try and lock this electrical activity uh, with respect to this particular stimulus that I have presented. This is basically what is called the event related potential. Now this alignment that I was talking about basically what it does is it eliminates variation in the signal that are happening due to random reasons that are happening due to say for example sometimes the natural activity of the brain or sometime uh, due to some other generic uh, stimuli or environmental stimuli that are present. So this extracted response as I was saying is referred to as the event related potential which is uh, a very very tiny signal embedded in the ongoing EEG uh, that was triggered in response to the stimulus. This ERP signal reflects neural activity specifically related to sensory, motor or cognitive event that has triggered it. So in that sense, it is a very good, you can make these correlations between the chronology of uh, stimulus presentation and the chronology of brain events that are unfolding in response to the stimulus presentation. ERPs therefore have been viewed as a very important tool for clinicians and cognitive psychologists. If for example, for clinicians a very good example will be that the visual evoked potential which is uh, gained from uh, the occipital areas of the brain, uh, they are very useful in determining or diagnosing patients with multiple sclerosis. What happens is that these electrical, in cases of multiple sclerosis, due to demyelination of the axons, the electrical signals from the neurons do not travel very quickly. And therefore, uh, what you can observe is you can observe a delay in the early peaks of this event related potentials. And therefore, if a neuroscientist is observing that, they can come up with the conclusion that there is uh, probably an onset or uh, an ongoing uh, case of multiple sclerosis here. In the same manner, uh, auditory evoked potentials can help localize tumors in the auditory processing areas as they are slightly informative of the anatomical source of this neural activity. Where is this neural activity generating? And in that sense, uh, you can sort of uh, figure out, okay, where the tumor might be.
I mean, you have to take this with a pinch of salt because whatever localization information we are obtaining from ERPs is basically indirect. There is this entire segment of uh, tissue between the origin of these uh, neural signals or electrical signals and what is being recorded at the electrode. So this is not really a very direct and a very definitive way of spatial localization of neural activity. Although it can say for example uh, using various ways be augmented and got a roundabout good estimate of uh, spatial localization if there are enough channels and there are enough uh, you know uh, software uh, methods uh, like um, functional connectivity analysis etc have been used. ERPs are found to be better addressed uh, for addressing, uh, better suited for be addressing questions about the temporal resolutions of cognitive events rather than to localizing brain structures therefore that produce uh, these uh, electrical events uh, in response to mental processes. Now finally we can talk about magnetic encephalography. So magnetic encephalography or MEG basically exploits the magnetic fields uh, that are produced perpendicular to the currents generated by the synaptic activity in the neurons. Now, MEG basically, MEG traces can, uh, can also be recorded in average over a series of trials just like the EEG method, uh, but MEG has a very significant advantage over MEG because it can give uh, as good as a temporal resolution as the EEG method, but it has ways of, uh, it as a method it provides a much better spatial resolution than uh, EEG or ERP. This property of the MEG methodology has made it a very useful uh, instrument for neurologists and neurosurgeons who have used it extensively to identify the focus of epileptic seizures for locating tumors in areas that are difficult to operate in the brain. So this is therefore a very useful method. Now MEG uh, although it is very advantageous as I said it has a couple of drawbacks as well two uh, very important drawbacks are that basically it can detect current flow only if the flow is oriented parallel to the surface of the skull so that kind of eliminates a lot of regions which will generate a current not parallel to the skull. Uh, so mainly uh, for MEG recording uh, signals can actually be obtained from neurons that are located within the sulci uh, within these uh, infoldings because where the long axis of these uh, you know apical dendrites tends to be oriented parallel to the skull. So this is where basically MEG can actually uh, extract most data from. Also as magnetic uh, fields uh, that are generated by the brain are extremely weak. Uh, MEG requires a lot of uh, expensive equipment to be set up say for example it requires a magnetically shielded room uh, from all external magnetic fields including the earth's magnetic fields, magnetic field generated by other electrical appliances or uh, wirings that might be going around. Uh, these devices which kind of uh, record the signal for MEGs are called squids which are superconducting quantum uh, interface devices. Uh, they also need to be encased in large uh, liquid helium containing cylinders so that the temperature is kept around 4 degrees uh, Kelvin and uh, can allow uh, you know better uh, recording. But then this is a very very expensive setup as compared to EEGs of which even mobile versions are being increasingly available now. So there is a bit of trade off between the cost and the uh, resolution of signal that you might be uh, gaining here. This is all about uh, some of these methods that we are talking about. We will continue this discussion in the next lecture. Thank you.